Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you're joining us from. Welcome to America Walks May webinar, Fuel for Active Bodies, Increasing Access to Healthy Foods. My name is Crystal Baum, the Program Manager here at America Walks, and I will be moderating today's session. I'm joined by my colleague, Kelsey Card, who is providing technical support and helping answer all of your questions. We would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors of today's program. The CDC and Everybody Walk Collaborative are sponsoring our webinar series this year. And we'd also like to thank all of our sponsors and generous supporters, including some of the ones you see featured here. We cannot do the work that we do without the help of our supporters and sponsors. We want this to be an active and engaging session today, so if you have a question or comment for our panel, please feel free to enter it into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel you see picture here. Please also use this space if you're having technical difficulties, and Kel Kelsey will help you address them. We will get to as many questions as we can with the panel at the end of the hour, and if we don't get to your question, we will do our best to get you an answer by email afterwards. I will answer one question I know I will be asked, and that is whether or not the slides and recording will be made available. Yes, the link to the recording, slides, and resources will be sent in the follow-up email, along with a survey we hope you take. We have a great panel for you today. Hanifa Ajuman is the Education and Outreach Director for the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Caroline, Caroline Harries is the Associate Director of the Food Trust. And Marisa Jones is the Healthy Communities Senior Manager for the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. Let's go ahead and get started with our first panelists, Caroline Harries and Marisa Jones. Caroline and Marisa, take it away. Thank you. We're just uh, getting our screen share here. Oh, uh, can you see our screen now? Great, there we go, show my screen, good. Um, great. Hi everyone, um, my name is Marisa Jones. I'm the- um, I'm sorry, Hi, I can't see your screen yet, sorry. Okay, um, we've got it up, let us know if you can see it. Not yet. Okay, I'll try pausing and then playing again. Let's see. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> terrific. Thank you so much. So, hi everyone. My name is Marisa Jones. I'm the Healthy Communities Senior Manager at the Safe Routes Partnership. I'm based in Philadelphia where I live a multimodal lifestyle. The Safe Routes Partnership works to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools and in everyday life improving the health and well-being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities, and building healthy, thriving communities for everyone. Our organization began that work with schools in mind and quickly realized that what's good for getting kids safely to school on foot and on bike is good for moving people of all ages throughout their communities to all kinds of everyday destinations, including grocery stores. With that in mind, about four years ago, we began researching strategies to improve access to healthy foods and learn that our friends at the Food Trust were thinking about similar things. Caroline and I will be co-presenting some of the work that we've done together to solve the interconnected challenges of healthy food access and safe, convenient transportation. Here's Caroline. Hi, everyone, and thanks, Marisa. Um, I'm Caroline Harris, an Associate Director with the Food Trust. Um, thank you all for being on the line today and for your interest in promoting access to healthy food. We're really excited to share uh, our work. Just a quick background on the Food Trust. We're based in Philadelphia, but we do work all across the country. Our mission is to ensure everyone has access to nutritious food and the information to make healthy decisions. We believe that to have the greatest impact, it takes a comprehensive approach that includes improving access to healthy food in a variety of venues, providing nutrition education in a variety of settings, and utilizing nutrition incentives to support the ability to purchase fresh and nutritious food. So we believe in Access, education, and incentives as our key tools for the comprehensive approach. We've, we're proud to have been working towards these efforts for over 25 years now. Our founder started the Food Trust with one farmer's market at Tasker Homes 
which is a public housing development in South Philadelphia. Once a week, uh, with the help of the Tasker Homes Tenant Council, the food trust would set up one long table overflowing with produce. It was the only source of fresh fruits and vegetables in the community. And in the two and a half decades since the opening of the Tasker Homes Market, the food trust has worked with neighborhoods, uh, residents, schools, grocers, farmers and policymakers across the country to change how we all think about healthy food uh, and to increase its availability in communities across the country. And we put together this infographic as a way to describe our comprehensive approach to this issue. And it also shows how it works intersects the food system at, at various places. And we know that healthy food access is a problem that is really widespread across the country. The USDA estimates that more than 40 million Americans live in low-income areas without access to affordable, nutritious food. So in these communities, families don't have supermarkets, grocery stores, or other places where they can find a fresh head of lettuce or a fresh apple. And though there are many factors that impact uh, body weight and overall health, it's important to address all of these factors. A growing body of research shows that people who live in communities without a uh, supermarket or grocery store suffer from disproportionately higher rates of diabetes and other diet-related health problems. And we've worked with PolicyLink, which is a research and advocacy organization based in California, to release um, some reports uh, about uh, access to healthy food and why it matters. Um, they're essentially lit reviews on, on all the research on healthy food access over the past several decades. And there are links shown here if you're interested uh, in viewing those. And what we found is that um, this is an issue that affects uh, many people across the country, um, particularly rural neighborhoods, predominantly black neighborhoods, and predominantly Latino neighborhoods have fewer supermarkets and more convenience stores than higher income urban and white neighborhoods. Uh, for example, one study found that lower income uh, zip codes have 25% fewer supermarkets and 1.3 times as many convenience stores as middle income zip codes. So in these communities, it may be easier to find a grape soda than a bunch of grapes. And we know that the food environment uh, impacts what you eat, uh, and we want to make the, the healthy choice the easy choice. Uh, without a grocery store nearby, people living in food deserts must rely on small neighborhood grocery stores, uh, which tend to sell limited healthy food options. Uh, and food that is both poor in quality and more expensive. Uh, during the past several decades, diet-related re disease rates have increased markedly, and the cause, again, are complex and numerous, occurring at social, economic, environmental, and individual levels. However, improving healthy food access has been shown to be an effective measure in improving healthy eating habits and lowering the risk for diet-related disease. Again, research indicates that Grocery stores and other healthy uh, food retail venues like farmers markets and healthy corner stores make an impact on healthier eating by making the healthy choice the easy choice. And then, of course, in addition to the health implications of low to no healthy food options, these communities are also missing out on the economic benefits of grocery stores, including jobs, attraction of additional retail investment, and even increase uh, in housing values. And we've worked on, with partners across the country on several um, programs to increase access to healthy food. As I mentioned, our comprehensive approach is, is really, um, we think, the best way to have a multifaceted approach to this issue. Um, but there's one program in particular that's related to our Safe Roots to Healthy Food work that I want to highlight and describe. Um, one, because it may be an existing or potential helpful resource in your community. And two, there are lots of synergies with our Safe Roots to Healthy Food work and uh, in working with partners to develop um, this model, um, transportation and routes to grocery stores has emerged as a critical aspect of, of this issue. So I'm gonna talk about the healthy food financing uh, model or HFFI just on the next few slides. So our work in the HFFI and grocery financing space emerged in the late 90s. We had heard from folks that they loved our nutrition education programming, kids were coming home and asking to make healthy recipes, but had trouble to act trouble accessing the ingredients to make those recipes in their neighborhoods. And while we had much positive feedback on our farmers markets, they're limited by the growing season and also just a couple of days a week. And we knew many of these neighborhoods were places where residents were also suffering greatly from diet-related disease. And so it ought to be easy to access healthy foods or year-round year sustainable venue. Um, and this was not an issue at the time. Um, high on the radar screen of policymakers. So one of the tools that we found really helpful was just creating a map to show visually neighborhoods that were lower income, had poor access to a grocery store, and were suffering greatly from death from diet-related disease. And those neighborhoods are highlighted here in red on this map. Uh, and the map really resonated with city leaders, and they asked us how to pull, they asked us to pull together a task force to come up with recommendations about how to address the issue. 
Uh, so we pulled together a multi-sector task force to identify key barriers to grocery store and other healthy food retail development in these neighborhoods and to come up with recommendations for better supporting uh, these venues uh, in underserved areas across uh, the state. And notably, in addition to um, having the civic sector and communities represented as well as public health and economic development, we had grocers and, and actual healthy food retailers involved so we could understand their perspective in terms of um, what would you know, you know, foster their development and preservation in these communities. The group together developed 10 recommendations towards this goal. And notably, transportation comes up as a key issue, and this was way back in the early 2000s, um, and potential support to improve access to healthy food. And you can see I've pulled out the recommendation here about transportation. Um, and this is the cover from the original report. It looks a little dated because it is. <laughs> uh, and ultimately, the group um, identified that there were a lack of resources to support the development uh, of healthy food retail venues in underserved communities, um, and that there were higher costs associated with developing for uh, a whole host of reasons from land assembly, um, onerous regulatory barriers. And there was no, you know, while there were many economic development programs out there, none of them were tailored to this issue. So they recommended that a program be created to support this very issue, getting healthy food venues into underserved communities. And that ultimately led to the creation of the Pennsylvania Fresh Food Finance in Initiative, which was the first HFFI or grocery financing program in the country dedicated to supporting healthy food retail development in underserved, low to moderate income, urban and rural communities across the state. And the program was seeded with funding through the state's Department of Economic Development um, as grocery access was seen as a key strategy to support the health and vitality of communities across the state. Um, the initiative approved financing for uh, about 90 projects that operated officially from 2004 to 2010 uh, and really had, you know, a significant impact in our state, uh, creating or retaining more than 5,000 jobs, increasing access to healthy food to close to half a million uh, residents. And um, the program was very flexible in terms of the type of project it, it could support. It could support a full service grocery store, uh, as well as farmers markets and uh, healthy corner stores. And um, it really recognized that one size does not fit all for each community. It's also really important that in addition to prioritizing projects that served low to moderate income communities that were underserved, a third key criteria was that uh, the community supported the project, that, that, that the project was what we describe a, a fit for the community, community fit. Um, and we knew that was important for project sustainability, but also to have the uh, most important impact for communities. Um, and so you can see the impact of here, you know, it was a statewide program, but these orange and yellow dots represent stores supported through the program. And you can see that they really did start to um, fill in the areas of greatest need that I had uh, showed previously throughout the city. Um, and so Healthy Food Financing Program, uh, the model has now been replicated by many around the country. Um, and these programs have several key features. They're structured as um, business financing programs programs that provide grants and loans for new and expanded uh, grocery and other healthy food retail in low to moderate income and underserved communities. They're typically administered by a community development financial institution since they often have a history of investing in low income areas and can administer the grants uh, and loans effectively and efficiently. They also, CDFIs also have the ability to leverage any seed investment from the public sector with significant private and philanthropic dollars, which can create an even larger pool of funding for the issue. And then typically the CDFI works in partnership with a food access organization, which has the expertise in understanding um, community need in underserved areas. And um, again, a key element of the program is it's flexible in terms of what type of project can be funded uh, from large format grocery store down through farmers markets, even food hubs increasingly and, and uh, corner stores, and then what those funds can be used for in terms of a range of, uh, including a range of pre-development and startup costs and also expansion and upgrade to existing stores. Um, the three key eligibility requirements, again, are that the uh, projects are low to moderate income communities that are underserved um, by healthy food retail, where there are gaps in access, and that there is community fit, um, so community support for the project. And so these programs, these HFFI programs, there's a federal HFFI program, um, as well as um, state and city programs across the country now. This map shows the distribution of federal HFFI grants awarded as of, as of the fall of 2018, as well as the location of regional, state, and city initiatives. 
So feel free to contact me directly if you're wondering if a program exists in your region and how to connect to it. Um, at the very end of the presentation, Maurice is going to um, show you our website, healthyfoodaccess.org, which is uh, provides information on um, the location of these programs and, and also how to advocate for them. So really wanted you to know that these programs exist, that they can be a help in improving access to um, healthy food. And um, now I'm going to pass it over to Marisa to talk a little bit more about active transit. Thanks so much, Caroline, for really framing the issue of food access and talking about healthy food financing initiatives as an extraordinarily powerful tool for improving food access. So I know that many of you on this webinar today are active transportation advocates or people who are interested in walking. So I'm sure that you are aware of the inequitable access to safe and convenient places for people to walk and bike. Um, and that's because historical public policy and funding decisions about transportation infrastructure have resulted in lower income communities and communities of color having less supportive facilities for walking and biking. And this has harmful and even fatal consequences. And sometimes people think about walking and biking as add-ons or things that are nice to have. But for many people, they're the only option for getting around, um, especially to access food. Everyone has to eat. It's not an option to go without food. And transportation is a significant barrier for people all across the country. Without access to a car, this can mean a long walk without sidewalks, a bike ride alongside speeding traffic, or a bus ride with inconvenient schedules or transfers. For elderly people, people with physical limitations, and families with small children, the challenges can be even more acute. News articles about people's experiences taking buses for two hours to get to the grocery store, or refugees walking alongside speeding traffic to get to the family dollar, which is the only place nearby that they could buy food, really resonated with both of our organizations. And data supported that this is not just, you know, an isolated issue in the one town that's featured in a news story. This affects people all across the country and we think that it deserves a concerted focus. In and of themselves, living somewhere that lacks places to buy healthy food and somewhere that lacks convenient public transportation options or sidewalks or bike lanes to support safe walking or bike riding are challenges. What we came together to focus on is where inequities in food access and transportation intersect. We're talking about neighborhoods and places that are both food deserts and transportation deserts. So what we would like to present to you today is the work of overcoming transportation challenges to healthy food access, a concept known as safe routes to healthy food. I'm gonna turn it over to Caroline to talk a little bit more about this concept. Thanks, Marisa. Um, so as Marisa um, articulated, uh, Safe Routes to Healthy Food is the work of overcoming transportation challenges to healthy food access. And it um, was really the merger of um, Safe Routes to Schools work on active um, transportation issues and our work on access to healthy food and um, recognizing that these are really um, overlapping and intersecting efforts. Um, we wanted to articulate the benefits of Safe Routes to Healthy Food, understanding the benefits can really help um, advocate for Safe Routes to Healthy Food and understand the importance of Safe Routes to Healthy Food. Um, Safe Routes to Healthy Food um, can improve the health of community. It can promote um, economic equity and vitality. It can increase efficiency by increasing the, the time it takes to access healthy food. And it, it can be um, a key support to building social capital infrastructure within a community by um, providing opportunities for people to easy, more easily gather and procure healthy food in their communities. We wanted to highlight um, four action steps to improve safe routes to healthy food that um, we've identified through this work over the past several years. And um, here are sort of the four categories and each have some subcategories. I'm gonna start by um, highlighting um, some of the work you can do to collaborate and make the case. And then Maurice is gonna talk more about how to make the connection possible, make routes accessible and accommodating, and then educate, activate, and incentivize. Uh, so in terms of um, collaborating and, and making the case, um, we've sort of identified four um, important aspects of that work. One is um, build partnerships. Um, 
The other is, um, which across sectors, um, communicate the interconnectedness of these challenges, uh, then engage affected community members, and then use data to make the case. And I'll walk through our thoughts on those. Um, we've uh, worked to build partnerships across the, set, the different sectors through our um, uh, national task force in 2016 with funding from Voices for Healthy Kids. Uh, Safe Roots to School National Partnership convened a national task force, um, which the Food Trust helped co-lead, along with organizations representing a variety of sectors, uh, food access, transportation, housing, racial equity, public health law, and more. And we worked to develop an action agenda for various sectors to improve access to healthy foods um, for people with low vehicle access. And we found that involving partners from multiple sectors is really critical toward building your case. And these groups um, have been really key to informing and developing our state groups to healthy food work and the recommendations um, that we've developed. Um, in terms of communicate the interconnectedness of these challenges, um, some of the core themes which, which have overlap with the benefits of safe routes to healthy food include um, the economic impact, uh, transportation access is essential for economic viability of grocery stores, easy transportation, access to grocery stores saves, saves time and therefore money, providing an economic benefit to communities, and then bike and pedestrian infrastructure promotes economic activity at businesses, especially where transit is unavailable. In terms of health, um, we know that it has an impact both on um, sort of higher rates of uh, weight-related chronic disease in area underserved by grocery stores, um, as well as um, an impact on the fact that there are higher rates of um, bike and pedestrian crashes and fatalities in low to moderate income communities and communities of color. So by promoting safer routes to healthy food, we're helping to address these uh, two health-related issues. In terms of sustainability, um, you can reduce um, reliability on individual vehicles by promoting better active transit routes to healthy food retail. Um, and then in terms of equity, you know, as Marisa articulated earlier, you shouldn't have to spend hours on the bus or risk your life walking and biking on unsafe streets just to get to the grocery store. Uh, and we know not everyone has access to a car, so we need to improve the various ways people get to, to various places they access food. Um, in terms of uh, working, engaging affected community members, we know that working with community members is the best way to understand the barriers and challenges to walking, biking, and taking transit to access to healthy foods. Um, we know that necessity is the mother of invention and that the best solutions are developed um, with community perspective. Um, so for example, on the Rosebud um, Indian Reservation in South Dakota, leaders of their community food sovereignty initiative undertook a community visioning exercise for a parcel of land adjacent to a major residential area of the reservation. And among the top priorities identified by the tribe was a multimodal trail connecting the residential community to three tribally owned and operated food venues, uh, a grocery store, farmer's market, and a community garden. So it's an example of a community informed um, solution and um, community how community involvement led to sort of a better solution for that community. And then we know it's important to use data to make the case. Um, this you know, I showed the map of how we use data to make the case for healthy food financing initiatives, and this is um, similarly a map of Philadelphia that the Health Department's Get Healthy Philly initiative created um, to show zip codes walkable access to healthy foods as measured by a 10-minute walk, um, and the areas of red and yellow have low to no access, so it's a great way to um, inform uh, policy and pro programmatic priorities. These are the areas where investment in safe routes um, can really benefit communities. To Marisa. Thanks, Caroline. I'm going to talk about the second action step to improving safe routes to healthy food. And that's to make the connection between where people live, work, and spend time, and where they want to access nutritious food. There's a physical and geographic component of this work that needs to be intentionally created. Um, so there are lots of ways to do this, and we're going to talk about a number of resources that we have at the end um, for in the interest of time and we're going to keep this fairly high level to give a big picture of what we what we mean. Um, but there are three like sub steps below this major action step of making the connection possible. So one way to do that is to articulate a vision for making that connection. So this is something that cities, states, transit agencies, community coalitions, and others can do. It's envisioning and planning for places that let everyone safely, conveniently access healthy food, even if they don't have a car. 
uh, we were really delighted to learn about this example from Emporia, Kansas, where the city um, just recently in April passed a Safe Routes Healthy Food resolution that sets forth a vision and affirms a commitment to um, healthy food access for people with low vehicle access. Um, so we were really delighted to, to learn about that. Um, another way that advocates can make the connection possible is to take advantage of existing land use and transportation planning processes to articulate the vision and identify strategies to improve active travel to food. So again, lots of examples of how to do this. We have many more of them in the resources that we'll share with you. But here's one example from Trenton, New Jersey. So in their health and food systems master plan elements, they include a strategic action to improve walking, biking, and transit access to healthy food outlets. And they specify the roles that various city and county agencies have in improving connectivity and suggest concrete steps that agencies can take to achieve that goal. Um, another example that's using a transportation planning process to improve healthy food access um, comes to us from Siler City, North Carolina, where the town's pedestrian master plan prioritized sidewalk and pedestrian improvements that connect residential areas with venues selling healthy food options. So another way to make the connection possible, so Caroline talked about, um, that, about healthy food financing initiatives and how they're a really powerful tool for bringing grocery stores to underserved areas. And she focused on one of the three key elements of the program as community fit. And so one way to, prom to make the connection possible for people without cars to get to grocery stores is to consider transportation access as part of a community fit analysis. Um, and she, uh, there's an example from the Massachusetts Food Trust Program. So they have a number of eligibility criteria um, for businesses that want to take advantage of these HSFI funds. One of those criteria, criteria um, is that the store has to be accessible um, to customers through a means of public transportation. So really great to see transportation access being part, being included in that community fit analysis. So the third key action step to working on safe routes to healthy food, once you've established that you can get from point A to a grocery store on foot, on bike, or bus, it's really important to make the route safe, convenient, and even enjoyable for people. So here are three ideas for how to do that. The first is to develop active design guidelines. Active design guidelines help communities plan and develop in a way that supports people to achieve daily physical activity as part of normal life activities. One example of active design guidelines that supports safe routes to healthy food comes to us from New York City, where their active design guidelines include four recommendations specifically related to improving walkable, bikeable, transit accessible food access. Another action step under making routes accessible and accommodating is really broad. This is really about making it easier and safer for people to walk and bike throughout communities. So we know that when we make it easier and safer for people to walk and bike to the grocery store, we're also making it easier and safer for them to move throughout their communities. It's really reciprocal. Um, so there are lots of ways to do that. We'll share one example from Cleveland, Ohio, where seniors in the city's Asia Town neighborhood conducted a walk audit of the route from their apartment building to their preferred grocery store and identified the need for park benches, a crosswalk at a major intersection, a curb ramp, and a corner-to-corner -corner crossing on a main road along the route. And we're also seeing emerging interest in prioritizing access to healthy foods as cities and states implement complete streets policies. So lots of different ways to use your efforts to improve walking and biking to also improve healthy food access. Um, we also see public transportation as having a really important role in our active transportation network. And so transit agencies can consider healthy food venues as part of their pl transit planning. And one example for this comes to us from Flint, Michigan, where the MTA, their transportation agency, responded to the closure of two major grocery stores on the east side by creating a dedicated ride to grocery bus line that links low food access neighborhoods to full service grocery stores. The fourth action step is to educate, activate, and incentivize. So we know that people need to be aware of the connections between where they live, where they work, and where they want to shop. 
Here's an example from around the corner of my, from my house where the bus ad panel advertises a one seat ride to a local market in Philly. Um, we have another example from Philadelphia of activating a route. The Bicycle Coalition here used its um, bike share ambassadors to take folks on bike share bikes to, um, on a tour of different farmers markets and community gardens. Um, and finally, you can incentivize the kind of behavior that you want to see. So this is an example from Spartanburg, South Carolina, and what had previously been a grocery store desert is now a farmer's market and to ease the burden on parking and promote physical activity, a local philanthropy provides market tokens to people who arrive on foot or bike. So, you know, we're running low on time, but I just want to highlight some key takeaways. So, to advance safe routes to healthy food, we, it's important to recognize the interconnectedness of the goals of safe human mobility and food access and work with partners to achieve those goals. Um, listen to community residents, focus on the many co-benefits of safe routes to healthy food, um, and join this movement. This field is evolving and we really invite you to be a part of it. Um, we have a number of resources available to help you learn more about Safe Routes to Healthy Food. We provided a really high level overview. We have a lot more specific examples of how to do this and how to work with partners like transit agencies, local governments, metropolitan planning organizations. Um, those are all available at saferoutespartnership.org. We can make sure that those get shared out with you. Um, and then, I'll turn it to Caroline to share about one I, more resource. Sure, I just mentioned healthyfoodaccess.org, and it has a lot of information about how to advocate for healthy food access in your community, as well as um, some of the HFFI programs that I mentioned are elevated, as well as a whole lot of other uh, information. A new look is launching this week, so check it out and um, get in touch if you have any questions. And with that, thank you so much. We um, look forward to any questions you have at the end of the webinar. Great. Thank you, Caroline and Marisa. Now we're gonna to go to Hanifa Ajuman. Go ahead, Hanifa. Hey everyone. Again, I'm Hanifa Ajuman. I serve in the capacity of Education and Outreach Director for the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. And I'm also a founding member of the organization. Um, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great, great. The Detroit Black Community Food Security Network was established in February of 2006. The organization was founded as a result of community members coming together to address issues of food insecurity in the city of Detroit and its impact on the city's majority African-American population. As our mission, um, we work to build self-reliance, food security, and justice in Detroit's Black community by influencing public policy, engaging in urban agriculture, promote, promoting healthy eating, encouraging cooperative buying, and directing youth towards careers in food-related fields. Our most visible initiative is a seven acre farm project, D-Town Farm. D-Town was established in 2006. We were originally um, on a quarter acre plot on Detroit's east side. Uh, we were soon displaced from that site because the site was purchased by developers. So we were offered um, an opportunity to cultivate on a half acre um, plot that was owned by one of the local churches. But again, in 2008, we were displaced from that location because the church um, had its own use of the site. So at that point, we moved to our current location, which is in Detroit's River Rouge Park which is the largest municipal park in the city. We initially began with two acres, but in 2010, we were able to acquire an additional five acres. So now we currently have expanded to seven acres. Um, at D-Town Farm, we grow approximately 30 
different varieties of fruits, vegetables, and herbs. This is um, a picture of our initial, our first garden location. And the person, the lady in the green is our first farm manager. This is our second location. And this is our current location. Uh, here we have young people, volunteers, who come out to the farm on Saturdays and Sunday mornings when we have community volunteer hours to work on the farm. Here you see they are laying drip tape in one of the growing quadrants. Um, because I, it's important that we revision what agriculture looks like for people of African descent, because we recognize that oftentimes the narrative or the um, lens by which agriculture is viewed is through the lens of our enslavement and sharecropping. So we also use the farm as a, a means of teaching the historical truths of the relationship between peoples of African descent and agriculture. Here we have uh, young people, um, these are high school students planting out at the farm. It's very important that we engage our young people in the work that we do because we recognize that ultimately all of this work is done for them. So in addition to growing food, we also grow community. Um, at D-Town Farm, each year we have a two-day harvest festival um, in, in September. And the harvest festival is a time where people who may not necessarily um, be interested in putting their hands in the soil, I can come to the farm and see what's being done at D-Town Farm and engage in a celebration where we all come together to celebrate our harvest and the work that we've done throughout the growing season. Uh, we have all types of entertainment during the Harvest Festival. Um, we also have food demonstrations. We have farmers markets set up a children's village, and just lots of community engagement. So here is um, a representative from Michigan State University during the Harvest Festival uh, doing a learn shop on nutrition. And as you can see, we have people in the community who come on bikes, people walk to the farm, from the community and all modes of transportation. We also have during um, the spring and summer growing season activities each month at the farm. So in May, we have what's called the D-Town Farm Bio Blitz. And the Bio Blitz is actually occurring at the farm this Saturday. So a bio blitz is an annual event that brings together um, youth, environment, environmental studies, graduate students, as well as professors and community scientists to identify the flora, fauna, and the fungi growing at the town farm. farm. So it's really, again, uh, a time to engage in community um, the children are learning, the adults are learning, and it's a wonderful experience that we all look forward to each year. So these are just some of the activities at the farm. And it, um, it really is an opportunity for young people who may not otherwise have uh, engagement in a natural setting to come out to the farm and just commune in nature. This is uh, one of the professors who um, each year comes out and participates with us at during the bio blitz 
uh, Dr. Yvette Perfecto. And I can certainly say that uh, Dr. Perfecto has widened my knowledge. Uh, she also is uh, an entomologist, so she has widened my knowledge of some of the insects that we find at D-Town Farm. And here's a group picture a couple of years ago of the participants, the youth and the adults who participated in the bio blitz. At the farm in July, we host what's called a health, a harvest health bazaar. Um, last year, Raj Patel and many of you may uh, be familiar with Raj Patel, who it, Patel, I'm sorry, who is an award-winning writer, activist, and academic. He has either written, uh, co-written several books, Stuffed and Starved, The Value of Nothing, and A History of the World in Seven Cheap Things. Uh, Raj is also currently working on a documentary highlighting the global food system. And last year, he brought two women from Malawi to D-Town Farm to talk about the uh, farming efforts that are happening in Malawi. In June, we have our annual herb walk uh, with one of our community herbalists, Dr. Jesse Brown. So again, it's um, an opportunity for the community to come out and learn about urban agriculture, to learn about food, to learn about food as medicine, which is very important because we often look at what we call weeds in our yards, in our front yards, and in our backyards, and never recognize the medicinal properties that those weeds contain. And I often tell the children that I work with in our Food Warriors Youth Development Program that Dr. George Washington Carver stated that a weed is simply a flower growing in the wrong place. So we have many opportunities to learn about food, to gain knowledge that will allow us to take control of our health outcomes and be able to pass this knowledge on to our children. And it's also important as um, a part of our work in social justice to recognize that as we work to become self-reliant as it relates to providing or establishing food security in the city of Detroit for all of our residents, we have to ensure that we ourselves are not marginalizing those that we work to bring um, to bring about food security. And so we are also engaged in disability justice in the city of Detroit to ensure that those who, for whatever form of disability, they are not out of the, the possibilities of the work that we are doing in, they are not left out of the possibilities of the work that we are doing in our food security movement. So in 2006, we not only established D-Town Farm, but the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network also wrote a food policy recommendation to the Detroit City Council. Um, the food policy recommendation was overwhelmingly approved by the council in 2008 and the Detroit Food Policy Council, I'm sorry, the food policy recommendation was um, approved by the city council and in 2009, 
the Food Policy Council was established. And as a result of the Detroit Food Policy Council's efforts and its collaboration with city government, Detroit now has an official urban agricultural ordinance that sets guidelines for how agriculture is done in, within the city limits. Um, each year, the Detroit Food Policy Council holds a food summit in March. And our probably largest um, and most ambitious initiative to date is the Detroit People's Food Cooperative. We are now in the process of developing a full service brick and mortar um, gross, uh, food Detroit food commons, which will include a member owner cooperative grocery store. The grocery store will carry a wide variety of products, including locally grown products, produce, groceries, baked goods, meats, fish, dairy, frozen foods, health and beauty aids. And um, they will also carry alcoholic beverages. The Detroit Food Pilot, I'm sorry, the Detroit People's Food Co-op will be located in the Detroit Food Commons, which will be a newly constructed building that will also house for incubated kitchens for community members who are interested in becoming food entrepreneurs but may not have access to a licensed kitchen. This will uh, provide an opportunity for those community entrepreneurs to be able to get their products to market. There will also be community meeting space and the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network's offices will be moved to the commons. Contemporary food co-ops in the United States, as um, we know them, exist primarily in predominantly white and often affluent communities. Um, and successful models that exist for food co-ops, there really aren't many that are serving predominantly Black and low-income communities. So this effort to develop a uh, food cooperative in the city of Detroit will serve as a model for communities, not only in Detroit, but across the country. And as an unbeknownst to many, Black co-ops have had a rich history in the United States. In 1907, the African-American scholar and activist, Dr. W.D. Du Bois doc documented over 154 African-American-owned cooperative businesses, producer cooperative, transportation cooperatives, distribution cooperatives, and real estate and credit cooperatives. So cooperatives have always been used um, in this country as a means of um, a way to address the issues of marginalization, discrimination, exploitation against the Black community. This is a photo of our spring celebration. These are member owners of the Detroit People's Food Co-op who have come out to celebrate our um, successes thus far. In March, as a matter of fact, on March 16th, we had our first annual um, meeting and we voted in our board of trustees, our uh, board of directors for the co-op. And these are some of the members who came out to the annual meeting. Our co-op presently has um, three working groups. So these are some of the members who are participating on 
the three working groups at a session, a working session. And our Food Warriors Youth Development Program is our youth program. The Food Warriors program teaches children not only how to grow food, but the children, in addition, learn how to prepare the foods that they are growing. And they are actually actively engaged when they're not actively engaged in gardening. The children are participating in health and nutrition education classes. Additionally, the children are introduced to the concepts of food justice and community activism. All of the activities of the Food Warriors program are grounded in an African-centered value system known as the Nguzo Saba, or what many people are familiar with as the seven principles of Kwanzaa. So here are the children um, at one of the after-school programs um, are planting. Not only, again, do they grow food, but the children, as part of the Food Warriors curriculum, the children also learn how to identify medicinal herbs. Here they are making a calendula salve from calendula flowers that they grew and harvested in their garden. And that's a picture of the finished product. The children also learn how to save seeds. So at this school garden, they are harvesting calendula seeds for the next season, the next growing season. Our food warriors have participated in professional conferences. Here they are presenting on the uh, food environments at a conference that was held in um, Lansing, Michigan called the Everybody Eats Conference. So the children have actually mapped out um, the food environment around their school. And this presentation is on learning how to read nutrition labels. Here, um, Eddie Mokibi, who is the vice president of Slow Foods International uh, and is from Uganda, Africa, came to visit um, the children, the food warriors at one of our after school programs. Um, and he shared with the children here some of the work and the activities that the children in Uganda are doing around agriculture. So it's very important that our, our, our children see the connectedness of themselves, um, continental Africans and people of African descent throughout the diaspora so that they have a healthy, understanding and relationship to agriculture and their relationship to agriculture. Here they have discovered uh, a caterpillar on one of the deal plants in the garden. So again, looking at nature and being um, involved with nature is very important for not just the children, for, but for adults as well. Um, not only do we engage in nature in the summer or spring months, but we take the children out in nature in the winter as well. This is a nutrition class where they are learning how to uh, classify and categorize the, um, the categories of food. In one of our uh, Food Warriors units that's entitled, Who Tells You What to Eat, which is um, a unit 
that the children have an opportunity to engage in and do some critical uh, thinking around the media and how the media um, has an impact on how they think about food choices. One of the activities in that particular unit is the children have to create a cereal product and they one of the well several of the um, stipulations of the activity is that they have to create a, a healthy cereal product but they also have to tell why the cereal is healthy why a parent would a parent or caregiver would purchase that particular cereal for their family and they have to create a jingle or a slogan for their serial creation. Um, we have here um, one of our community nutritionists who's doing what she likes to call a play shop as opposed to a learn shop with the children. Um, and this is an opportunity for them to play with their food and not be admonished for it. And after the children um, created their art masterpieces with their fruit, their smiling faces, then Dr. Valanda took them through some exercises that they could do when they're in the classroom, when they get uh, antsy, um, she showed them how they could, there are exercises that they can do right in the classroom. And this is um, the last slide that, uh, of the presentation. And this is a slide that I like to use to close out the presentation because it encapsulates um, what we are doing in the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Um, part of that is revisioning what agriculture looks like for people of African descent. So the banner um, behind the two ladies says, there is no culture without agriculture. And so it's a reminder to us that, as you saw in the earlier slide, um, the representation of African people and their relationship to agriculture for 7,000 years. This lets us know that agriculture far exceeds the time of our enslavement as a matter of fact one of the one of the things that i teach our young people in the food warriors youth development program is that one of the reasons not the only reason but one of the reasons that our ancestors were enslaved is not because of their ignorance of agriculture but just the opposite their it was their genius of agriculture, their knowledge of food ways, their knowledge of the cultivation of the plant and the domestication of the animal so that they should never ever feel that agriculture is something that they should shy away from. And in addition, looking at the work that we are doing, we understand that this work is work that we are carrying on, we are carrying forward from those who have gone before us. And as we see the elder in this picture, we recognize that this elder will transmit the knowledge that she has from this young mother and in turn, we also remember that our young people have knowledge that we also can learn from them. So 
again, the mission of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is to build self-reliance, food security, and justice in Detroit's Black community. Thank you. And so um, if you all have uh, any questions, I will certainly um, address those questions. And we also have um, our, a Facebook page and our website is located on the slide. Wonderful, thank you so much, Hanifa. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm gonna need to get that uh, recipe for the calendula salve. I'm growing calendula in my garden right now. So I will, oh, follow, wonderful. I, will, <laughs> I, will follow, I will follow up with you right away. Um, and so unfortunately it doesn't like we're gonna have time for questions during the oh. broadcast. Um, however, um, we will follow up with our panelists. So if you send in questions, we will do our best to get answers to your questions and we will um, follow up on our website and then um, email you those. Uh, we want to give another big thanks to all of our sponsors and supporters who allow us to continue providing our programming. We cannot do our work without all your support. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Our next webinar is called Safe Speeds, Safe Communities, Partners in Speed Management and will be held on June 12th at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern. We will look at how organizations and individuals can work together to decrease speed and increase safety in their communities. There will be a registration link in the follow-up email for today's webinar. There will also be a link to a survey in the follow-up email, so please take a minute to let us know how we're doing. We value your feedback and it helps inform our future work. So with that, I will say goodbye to our amazing panel, Kelsey and all of you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks again for joining us.